Hello. I'm so impressed. So many people made it to the last talk. <laughs> so my name is Christopher Newth. Um, I'm a geoscientist. I consider myself, I'm interested in geomatics, remote sensing. And together with my colleague, Sonja Greve, we have been looking at the open light art archive of the Norwegian government, shall I say. And I guess what inspired this talk for me was meeting the people developing open topography, if anybody knows what that is, where you can access it. And so the basis of this talk is basically to showcase that data set. Um, I'm going to go through a little history, and then I'm going to talk about the data and how you get it. I'm going to discuss shortly some of the methods, but very not detailed. And I'm going to discuss some of the accuracy of the data sets that are on there. And then I'm going to talk briefly again classification and issues we've had actually scaling, which I've heard many good talks about so far, and then end up with use cases. So in 2010, the Norwegian government passed the Spatial Data Act. And basically what this did is this like paved the way for opening up a national infrastructure for housing and actually distributing geospatial data. The other thing this did was that ensured anything publicly funded acquisitions would be given to the public to be able to download. So in 2016, the government started a, a project called the National Detailed Terrain Model Project. And what their mission was to create a one meter DM over the entire country and basically using laser scanning all points or all ground coverage greater than two points per square meter. How they were going to accomplish this was using only private companies and then all data was made publicly available. Now you can go onto these websites. There's two different um, front ends or websites now. And you can actually, if you, I think you have to register, but maybe not even not, you can search the archive and you can just download laser data. Um, currently, as of last week, this was the coverage. And the majority of the coverage is LIDAR. But there's areas where they only do photogrammetry because there's not much um, vegetation. So then they choose to only use photogrammetry and air flights on this. Um, status as today is 230,000 square kilometers are laser scanned. Um, I write 12 terabytes of compressed data, but this is like double compression. So it's not just LAS, it's then all the LAS files compressed again. Um, 13,000 individual projects, which are individual acquisitions from one flight. And then what they're doing is using private companies. So the private companies are acquiring this stuff, processing the data, and submitting it back to the mapping authority. Um, some of this work is maybe a year too old. So these are a bit outdated, but it gives you an idea of like the ground point coverage over the entire country. And the most, the highest acquisitions are usually where the populated places are. And along corridors, we have roads and rivers and landslides and other things. Um, the other thing you'll notice is that there's a temporal portion to this. Of course, the project didn't start until 2016, but you see data from back in 2003 years now available. This is quite interesting because then you can start thinking about doing change detection. You can start comparing. And um, looking, looking just at the histogram of the projects, you can see there's quite a data from before 2016 here. And then on this plot, you can see anything that's darker has more temporal coverage. And so it's a majority where the um, people live. Um, basic characteristics of the data is that all the data is chopped up into a national grid. And it's actually a, a standard grid. And they're about one to two kilometer tiles. And what the companies have to do, they have to provide original point clouds. And they have to be classified. Some basics, some are more advanced. So the basic ones have ground, noise, and everything else. Um, some of the more advanced ones have power lines and everything else. So you can do any type of classifications and test them. Um, the companies also had to provide digital terrain models, digital surface models. Um, you get metadata, which includes flight lines, border polygons, um, point density, and a project quality report, which um, in my opinion is quite limited. The reports of these don't really show exactly how they tie their data to the surface of the system. But you can t check it out. and. So the methods that we use are mainly open source of Python, 
Pidal or Poodle or whatever, the Dal, <laughs> Cugis. Um, we also looked a bit at Cloud Compare, Whitebox, and Last Tools. I'm not really showing much of this, but I'm just going to show some results or talk about some results. And one of the basic, even though all these DMs are created already, we decided let's do it ourselves. So we take our raw point cloud through the Smurf filter, and then we ended up getting ground classified. And we get four products out of this, a surface model, a terrain model, um, a height over ground model, and a density. Um, we compared and tried also the last tools, the P-TIN, and the white box tools. And I think the results that we have is that the Smurf filter is the fastest and most robust. And you can actually pre-parameterize it based on your topography. And that makes it really automated if you know which parameters you want for the type of topography that you have. So this is really awesome, awesome job, Pito. And here's some of the comparisons. I just grabbed a region. This is actually not far from my house. And showing one area that's got three acquisitions, one in 2013, one in 2015, and one in 2017. And looking at the ground point coverage is exactly almost like you can see it on the map here on the histogram. The 2013s is less than two points per square meter. Um, 2015, you're getting different lasers and you're getting above two. And then in 2017, you have a really great coverage with up to four, almost 10. This is just a forest patch here because I talk a little bit about vegetation as well. So this just shows you some of the data, some of the qualities of the data. Now, I'm just gonna compare what we did when we do a DTM from these two products just to see what's the accuracy of the raw data that we're getting. And so generally the accuracy is quite good, plus minus 25 centimeters. That's within the specifications of the Norwegian government. But when you look at the data, you'll see the flight lines here in purple. And so I guess this is something very common is that I think it's problems of the, the gyre and lack of maybe correction of it. So in some of these jumps will be up to about half a meter, but that's within the original data and maybe the, some corrections can be made. Now, choosing five or three other places here, just a like, spot check, um, we see the same pattern with these flight lines. Um, here is a valley, and so up on the steeper parts of the valley, you see that the errors get a little bit more. And that's just depending on where that LIDAR actually reflects from, how big the footprints are, that sort of thing. But up here, here's where you see a difference between a LIDAR and then a photogrammetric DEM. And so what you're seeing here is, I think, errors of the block adjustments. And you see that in green down here that their accuracy is actually maybe about a meter, 50 centimeters. So just some uh, qualities of the data sets, it's still phenomenal. Once we get our ground out, we also have now then a non-ground point cloud. And we're like, okay, what methods can we use to begin segmenting this? I saw some great talks uh, yesterday using machine learning. We also tried, but we used Cloud Compare because they have Canupo, which is using support vector machines. But before I did that, or we looked at Padal and covariance features, and we extracted all these in Python just using SciPy, simple clustering, unsupervised. And we can get out vegetation. And just to show you a bit of an example there, here is a um, colored point cloud. You have buildings, trees, roads, and some other things. And then when you pull out the ground, you get everything else. And then you throw it through a simple k-means that goes really fast in Python, and you get man-made objects. Um, I'm not going to go so much more into detail here because that's a kind of ideal situation. Of course, you have other things, power lines and stuff like this, but still this type of stepwise approach down to classification and segmentation is, is what we want to do. So we tried out also um, Canupo, and I'm going to go into some of the details there in a second because I had major problems scaling it. But here's just a vegetative area, and we wanted to calculate a vegetation density. But a vegetation density is very dependent on what kind of coverage you got, what kind of laser. So how are you going to compare? So I normalize it. And so when we count the number of points within pixels and normalize it by the ground coverage, or actually not the ground coverage, the total coverage, we can get like a density map. And you'll see like here it's a little bit darker, here it's more dense, and I think that this is actually related to topography as well. It's a steeper slope here. 
So on these types of things, you're not getting actually, it's not really a vegetation density. It's actually something that needs to be corrected. But this is what we're working towards. Um, just to discuss a little bit, we had major issues scaling when you're trying to run this on 13,000 projects or 1,300 projects, which probably consists of about 20, I don't know, 50,000 files. I have a big server, lots of RAM, still took six months to process, at least. So uh, I also, with the point cloud classification, unsupervised was really cool and fast, but we wanted something supervised. But we couldn't scale up what was built in cloud compare. And I don't know, I started, I've been seeing some great talks, your talk yesterday, Brad, and I'm wondering if I should, I'm a little bit inexperienced in this, so I wonder if I should be using Postgres, Postgres and Twine. Um, and also, developing routines, I think, for GPU processing, TensorFlow PyTorch. And I think that would maybe speed up the issue. Any solutions available? I saw some great talks yesterday, so hopefully, soon. So just to show some case studies of this data set and what it's being used for. So in 2020, right before 2021, there was a quick clay slide. And this is not far from where we work in, um, in Oslo, but an area with a whole bunch of houses suddenly gave way. And you see this car almost drove right into it. Um, the authorities have done quite a few scans, and so this is just to show you some of the, you will notice right up here, this is an orthophoto. This is then a hill shade from the year before, and then after. And so it, the data is quite accurate, so you're getting quite an, uh, an amazing precision of detail in this. I'm gonna zoom in in a second, but what you mainly see is that the mass here slid down and filled up inside these small valleys. You can then difference these and you get two profiles. This is a cross profile here, and you see about a 20 meter difference. And a longitudinal profile where you see actually the, the mass flowing down. Um, this was a, quite a tragic event. I can uh, show you what the mapping authorities put together, because this is pretty amazing when they showed this, because you're actually seeing the color of the houses that fell down. And so they were using this to try and locate people. Um, another example, um, this is quite a funny event, they call a piece of rock up here the man. And for a period of about three to four months, we had slow TV in Norway, where they had a camera focused up at this rock, because they were afraid it was going to move down. And it never happened. <laughs> it kept going, and then when they, they used LiDAR and found displacements. This is actually going downhill this way. And they found that the rock was separating here, moving up here. This is from LiDAR data. And eventually, it actually did come down, not as big as they wanted it to. But then Lena Christensen and them could do a nice study and measure the change in the amount of rock coming down. So for landslide purposes, for monitoring, for measuring, these, these data sets are absolutely crucial. And then the last example I want to show, um, flood risk and flood mapping. Um, what was it, 2018, in October, there was a lot of snow in the mountains, and it got very warm very fast, and the rivers weren't ready for this, and this swamped an entire yeah, village, shall I say. And a master's student took the LiDAR data and started using HECROS, which is a hydraulic model for modeling the flum, and he was able to reproduce quite well the flood extent. So for, for preparing for these types of events, this data is absolutely, you couldn't, you couldn't run this model without this LiDAR data. Um, and then just to summarize, um, high resolution LiDAR data is available over in the entire country in Norway. Um, it's open. Download it, use it, try to train. Some of it's classified, some of it's not so well classified. Um, the quality, it's variable, just like if anybody saw Howard's talk, the early data is very low quality, but the later data, sometimes you're getting up to 25 meters per, or 25 points per square meter. So you can find some uh, treasures in here. It's multiple use cases, change detection, vegetation modeling and monitoring, risk mapping. Um, the open source processing is amazing. I'm just having trouble scaling. How can we process all this data in a consistent manner? If anybody has any suggestions, let me know. And that's it. Thank you.